My hero. Am I a hero? We're here to challenge your definition of a hero. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of 10,000 Heroes, the podcast. Today, we have Nate doing an interview, and you haven't done one for a while, so I'm so happy to hear your voice on this. And Nate is interviewing Laura Chavez Silverman. I found it a totally beautiful interview. I loved what she's saying about our relationship internally and externally with nature, how we approach the woods, what we can find there in that liminal space between ourselves and the woods. But what I would like as a way of an introduction, if you could just provide us with a little background on what, you know, you, you mentioned it in the podcast, the Outside Institute, but yeah. there's not much of a description. So I'd love like yes. a little, just a brief like bio of who Laura is. Thank you. What she's Thank doing. you for that opportunity. That's, that's a great idea. So Laura runs these walks uh, in the area in which we live. This is kind of upstate New York, Ulster County. These walks are opportunities for people to get to know nature, get to know plants. So that's what the Outside Institute does. But then she's also quite the chef and works locally to collaborate with different craft cocktail bars, restaurants, things like that, to bring foraging into this culinary experience and also teach people that you can bring some stuff home and have a really delicious dinner or make an incredible cocktail with something that you just found just down the road. Yeah. So get, get at people's relationship with the natural world through their stomachs, through the gut. Through their pleasure. Mm. You know, which is something we talk about in the discussion. I, I almost feel like in some ways, this is a good sequel to Rick's, Rick Jarrow's interview. This idea to follow beauty to follow aesthetics, to follow our attraction into life, to be seduced by our curiosity and interest and let that carry us into a, a deeper relationship. And in this case, that deeper relationship is with nature itself, which is all around us. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's roll it. All right, Laura. Welcome to the show. Thank you. In our email exchange, uh, you had some great ideas of things we might discuss, and I thought we might launch in on, on one of those points that'll set us up to talk about uh, a whole bunch of things, I think. And it, it plugs in nicely with my conversation with Rick Jero. He mentioned uh, he had taken one of Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, classes or workshops. And in her presentation, uh, she made somewhat of a theatrical point, or at least something that hit home with Rick, which was first she put up a slide of 50 of the top corporations' logos and asked the room how many people recognize these logos. And most people could recognize most of the logos by and large. Her next slide was a slide of local fauna, plants that were uh, indigenous to that region. And almost no one could recognize any of the species of plant. And I'm wondering if this is what you mean when you say, you said in our email exchange, plant blindness. Does this get close to what you were talking about? Yes, so, precisely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny. I've seen that um, those two uh, pictographics side by side and um, have used them in presentations myself. I never realized that um, that, that was something that Robin Wall Kimmerer used. But it really um, starkly illuminates the fact that we just don't recognize any of the flora, fauna, or fungi with whom we share this landscape. And um, I, I like that term plant blindness. It was coined by some botanists to describe what is essentially like a blurring effect that we superimpose on our surroundings. Um, everything just turns into kind of a sea of green and mm. 
it's as if we've just lost our powers of observation. We never get really granular with um, the individual characteristics of all the different plants. Um, hmm. So I do feel like a big part of the work that I do is combating plant blindness and helping hmm. people come to see in what really feels like a new way. It requires hmm. um, a kind of slowing down that we're not used to and the kind of focusing that our brains aren't really um, geared towards these days. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fun for people, I think. This, this acuity to sort of be attuned to your natural surroundings, um, have the acuity of eyesight, smell, listen to kind of your, what's, what's happening around you. This was something that our ancestors needed for survival. A, a person living now in a, in a developed sort of, um, let's just say North America and United States, someone living in a city can order uh, Thai food through Seamless, have that dropped off at their door. They get all of the kind of stimulation they need from a Netflix binging session. They have their social interactions on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. And you'd say that sort of some of these skills are just necessities for our ancestors have kind of fallen away, maybe, for a lot of us. I guess the question is two parts. One, if we don't need it for our immediate survival, quote unquote, what do we need it for? And I guess the second prong of that question is, is it something by doing some of the work you do, exploring this on our own, actually like taking a proactive role in developing those acuities? Is that something we can reclaim, even though the culture seems to be going in a very different direction? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. So you know, I would say that arguably, you know, we do, we do need those skills may not be for our short term survival in terms of getting through the day or the week or the month or even the year. But I would say for our long term survival as a species, those skills are definitely required because it's mm. through the loss of them that we've come to a place where we have jeopardized our environment quite possibly um, to the extent of our own extinction. Hmm. Um, by losing touch with the ability to uh, connect with the plants and the animals and all of the elements of our environment, by losing sight of our interconnectedness, um, we are experiencing a massive breakdown of all of these crucial symptoms uh, rather systems that are essential for our survival on this planet. I mean, people talk a lot about the earth being in jeopardy and the, and the planet being at risk, but really that's not the case. The earth has been here for billions of years before us and will survive us. It will do fine. It will recover and recuperate. What hangs in the balance is our existence as a, as a species. Hmm. So, and then to answer the second part of the question, you know, can these skills be reclaimed? Absolutely. I mean, they're just lying right below the surface. Um, mm. And we knew, we use versions of them all the time. I think, um, you know, I really noticed the way people bring kind of a, what I call a retail mindset to the outdoors. They arrive at the edge of the forest. They're very excited about what they can get. And that used to, kind of irritate me. I thought, oh, this is because we're so used to shopping. You know, we're all out there, you know, we, we come with this retail mindset because that's the transactional nature of our existence now. But I've come to believe that it really taps into something much more primal in us, which is that hunter-gatherer instinct. I mean, we lived on this land as hunter-gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years before industrialization. Hmm. And so each of us, you know, is programmed 
it's in our DNA to sort of seek and find the things that we need for our comfort and our survival. Mm. So I don't, I try not to judge people anymore when they come on walks and, you know, their questions are always like, can I eat that? What can I do with that? Like, what will this plant do for me? But um, I think that that is one very important way that we can come to connect. And, you know, part of what I teach is very much using all of your senses to try to come into relationship with these things that we encounter. What does something feel like? What does something smell like? Um, with a little respect and knowledge, what does something taste like? Um, you know, yes, what can it do for me? And also in return, what can I do for it? What do I have to offer back in return? <clears throat> this is something that Robin Wall Kimmerer talks a lot about as well is this idea of reciprocity. So I think in the kind of retail mindset that we have, uh, you know, really dug in deeply to in the last couple hundred years, we've lost that kind of reciprocal nature. It's more of a barter kind of a mentality that I would like us to be able to get back to. Hmm. Would you say that that process, that sort of industrialization, maybe you, you use that term, inherent, there's sort of an alienation there. I'm wondering if you think that extends to our own bodies in terms of how we relate to nature, how we might be at home or not within ourselves, within our own bodies, within kind of our own experience. Well, that's interesting. I never really thought about it uh, in those terms. I think that, you know, historically, there has been a real desire to have dominion over nature. Uh -huh. And I think that, you know, it starts with, I mean, I don't really know, even know where it starts, but it's in the Bible and, you know, this idea that man will decide and man will be in charge of and, mm. you know, that man enters into a covenant with animals to protect animals and in return eat animals. Um, and there's all this kind of like institutionalizing of our relationship to to the natural world. I don't even like to say the natural world really, because I feel like it sets up this false dichotomy between the world and the natural world, like the world that humans inhabit and then the natural world. When really there's just the one world, you know, sure. but even in that dichotomy that we've set up, you know, you can see this like separation that we've created. Um, and, you know, does that, you know, become projected onto our relationship with our own bodies. Um, it's such a complex question. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I feel like this idea of dominion has extended to our own bodies in this way that we, um, we are in charge of our health and we um, are sort of medicating and um, tweaking and fixing and adjusting and, um, you know, but it seems to all be kind of happening in this sort of vacuum of disconnection from what is truly our nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you know, not to go too much off on a tangent, but it, to me, it does feel like a lot of that is related to sort of industrialization and commercialism and, um, you know, the body is, a commodification of the body, if you will. Um, you know, we can perhaps even start to trace it back to capitalism if you want to. Um, which uh, sometimes yeah. I feel is at the root of all evil, this idea uh, that hmm. we live in a system that is constantly demanding growth, that everything must continue to grow. I mean, by hmm. definition, it's unsustainable. Hmm. Well, you said a couple salient points in there that maybe are worth fleshing out, I, I think was, I'm paraphrasing, but there, there's nature, the natural world, and there's our world, and that nature is somehow beyond or separate or something that is implicitly not this, not our domain. I, I think if you just spend a couple seconds thinking about it, if anybody does, 
what can we say is not nature? Like what, what is really supernatural or what, what's beyond nature? If nature just is everything that we can understand or witness or observe, including ourselves. I, you know, um, without biting the, the capitalism bait, I, I think there is something pretty fundamental to a certain stream of Western thought that maybe finds its root in kind of Descartes, this Car Cartesian ideology, this dualism that I think, therefore I am. There's the mind and there's everything else that can be divided and maybe manipulated or reduced to some behavior or mechanism. Seems to me that seems pretty fundamental to this idea of separation. There's, there's me, what I can, this thinking self and the rest of nature, which is like kind of sets up this dynamic of me against that. Well, you know, <clears throat> we do have a very powerful intelligence. I was just reading there was a Time Magazine article about Jane Goodall, and she hmm. she talks about you know the nature of human intelligence being sort of a, a separating or differentiating factor between us and the animals. But <clears throat> I mean, the more we learn, the more scientists investigate and prove, the more we come to see that there are different kinds of intelligence equally powerful or potentially more powerful. Um, you know, what Suzanne Samard has recently revealed through her research about the way that trees communicate via the mycelial network, um, just the intelligence of, of the fungi, slime molds are have a very particular kind of intelligence that we're only beginning to start to understand through scientific research. And so, you know, to say that our intelligence sets us apart, I mean, I'm not even really sure clearly our intelligence has vaulted us into this future of our own making. Is it a good thing? I can't say that it is. Mm-hmm this human constructed reality, it's possible to step outside it and still have an existence, you know, on the earth. Mm -hmm. So it's not the only thing that there is. Of mm. course, you know, the impact that we've been able to have in a relatively short time is truly staggering. I don't know if you've seen that little short film called four seconds. Mm -mm. Um, a few different people have um, created this model of time that uh, calculates um, the entire amount of time that humanity has been on earth. Um, there's two models. One is a 24 hour model and another is um, I think an hour model or something like that. And um, if you look at it in terms of a one hour, then the time that humans have been uh, alive and active um, in history is only three seconds at the very mm. end. Mm. And in those three seconds, in this eternal hour that we've, you know, that the, that the earth has existed, we've been able to inflict so much damage. I mean, other things too, but basically the impact that we've had has been just huge and out of proportion. Um, so the idea in this little film is, you know, what do we have to do to get to the fourth second? Hmm. And, you know, there have been all these environmentalists, you know, screaming about how the end is nigh and our hair is on fire and we have to do things. And, and yet it's just like moving the Titanic. You know, okay. how will we ever make the change that we need to make in order to survive in a way that is recognizable to us perhaps as a good transition into maybe we could speak a little more specifically about the outside institute well the outside institute takes small groups of 12 to 15 people out on what i call guided nature walks if i call them 
foraging walks, a lot more people want to come. But I stubbornly persist in calling them guided nature walks because we are not just arriving at the edge of the forest looking for things to eat. We are arriving at the edge of the forest in anticipation of learning about everything that we encounter. Mm -hmm. And as I tell people often who are interested in foraging, it's really not possible to be a successful forager by just going out and looking for the one thing. If you want to mm -hmm. find morels, you have to understand what trees they grow with. And mm -hmm. as soon as you are trying to look for one thing, you stumble into this interconnectedness of all things. So we move into the forest with the intention of just paying attention um, and observing and learning each, each thing that we encounter, each plant, each insect, each fungus, each tree, each bit of moss. Of course, I don't know it all. So <laughs> I'm just teaching about what I know, but every year knowing a bit more the first obstacle maybe you encounter in impressing this mindset on a group of people is something that they show up with already the retail mindset retail mindset in your observation what has been the instrumental sort of experience in someone flipping from that to the other and i'm wondering if you could help us define what a different mindset might be like one that's not expecting something from a walk to just walk home with a handful of morals or ramps or whatever popular sort of goodie might be um, in season. What does that other mindset, what can that other mindset afford us? What's on the other side of that retail mindset and what has some opportunity of loosening it? It's great. Well, First, I just do want to reiterate that I, you know, I see the the other side of that coin being, um, you know, something that's very deeply ingrained in us, um, mm. part of our survival mechanism. So it's not it's not strictly, you know, a feature of of modern living that we have that retail mindset. I feel like our relationship with the land has always been a little bit about, you know, going out and getting things. Um, mm. and I'm interested, you know. There, there's a lot more interest from women. Um, you know, I do, there are men on the walks, but I do notice, um, I would say it's about 75% women to 25% men. And I've wondered mm -hmm. if that's because women traditionally were more the gatherers in general. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps they have a stronger, um, it, you know, innate relationship to plants than men do. I don't know. Um, and women were often farmers um, in indigenous societies as well. So, um, but to answer your question, you know, it's really incredible. I, I've never taken people out on a walk in the forest and had to instruct them um, or really tell them to turn off that retail mindset because what happens is that in the experience of being in the forest and encountering all these plants, they naturally acclimate to this state of wonder and appreciation, curiosity and amazement um, to a person. So they may come into the forest wanting to find the ramps, but in the process of observing and learning about everything else that they encounter, they automatically go through this amazing transformation. It mm -hmm. just happens mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of, you know, direction, a little bit of elucidation and education. Um, you know, what I do is I tell them the stories of these individuals. I talk to them about, you know, the role of the oak tree in the forest and the way that um, it's host to hundreds and hundreds of insect species. And the fact that, you know, blue jays are responsible for planting about 45,000 acorns a piece every year. 
and that that's the way that oaks spread because of blue jays. And, you know, these stories are just enchanting and they begin to understand the individual characteristics and, you know, where possible, I pull in, you know, folklore and indigenous knowledge, um, of science, of course, um, culinary and medicinal information and all of these facts kind of build up these really compelling portraits of these individuals mm. that they're encountering in the forest and, and they fall in love. Mm. We have a couple of oak trees uh, outside our house. And I think there, there were more acorns this year than I certainly remember from last year. I mean, they were just like, we're out there having coffee one morning and they're just sh shooting. It was hard to not take it personal. These acorns were just uh, like it was just like out of a Uzi or something, just shooting out in all directions. My partner Elena informed me this is called a mast year that we're having, and she explained it a little bit to me. I'm wondering if, for the listeners, you could kind of elucidate what a mast year means. But I'm curious, I want to, want to ask you some questions after that, because this is such an interesting idea to me. Uh, well, a mast year, science is not exactly sure why it happens. It's probably a combination of a variety of factors, but mast is the term um, that's used for the fruits and nuts that are produced. So mm. mast is uh, blackberries and blueberries and cranberries and black walnuts and acorns and all the fruits and nuts that are produced um, by the forest. And a mast year happens kind of randomly. It generally happens with all of the plants in a given region. And it's like a coordinated year of bounty. And there's a few different theories about why it happens, but it's probably some kind of population control. One theory is that there'll be such an abundance, say, of acorns that the squirrels can't possibly get them all. And so that there's a much bigger saplings of, of oaks the following season. So mm -hmm. it's a way for the tree to kind of get a leg up that year. So anyway, yeah, a mast year happens usually every several years, and it doesn't tend to happen two years in a row. Yeah. I guess what was so interesting about that to me is that, like you say, it's this strategy, right? It's a procreation strategy. We're not exactly sure why. And maybe why we're not exactly sure why is sort of some of these processes that you see in natural living systems just aren't reducible to a single cause. That's right. Have, I'm reading this book, The Nature of yeah. Oaks. He talks just exactly about that, how you know, different scientists come up with different theories and probably they're all right. Yeah. So it's like this feature uh, of, of that cycle it emerges from millions of years of contact and interrelationship with all these different species. And so like this, the squirrel population is kind of embedded in that and like the oak and the blueberry, the blackberries, they've kind of symbiotically developed the strategy. To, totally. And also yeah. with, with all of the insects um, in this book, he was talking about, I can't remember the author right now, sorry, but um, he was talking about how certain insects evolved to tolerate more tannins, like oak leaves are filled with tannins. And certain, a lot of insects feed on the leaves and certain ones evolve, you know, over a long, long period of time to be more tolerant of the tannins. Just like, for instance, um, the milkweed um, latex is not toxic to the monarch butterfly caterpillar because it's developed over a long period of time to be in relationship with this plant. So it can eat the leaves of the milkweed when it's born. And the toxic latex that's in the plant is not toxic to the caterpillar, but nevertheless renders the caterpillar toxic to predators. Hmm. 
So I, I wonder what what's being expressed through the outside institute and the teaching you're offering and, and this viewpoint, this perspective on life. Has this been something that you've carried with you since a very young age? Was there some aha moment? And I guess, how did you come to, to make this uh, such a central point in your life and your, your interest? Well, I grew up in, uh, in Northern California and with parents that were um, very... Uh, pleased to share with us, my sisters and me, um, their love of nature and the wild. Um, we spent a lot of time vacationing like in Yosemite and we walked in the redwoods a lot. I mean, I grew up in Santa Cruz where the redwoods meet the ocean. I remember tide pooling and being spending a lot of time outside. But then I grew up and moved to the East Coast and uh, kind of lost that connection to nature. I was very enamored of the city mm. and city life. And I lived that for a long time. I always loved birds and plants and um, I've always been really drawn to organic materials. Like my home was always filled with wood and marble and stone and things I found mm. outside and um, that always resonated with me but it wasn't until I moved to LA in the late 90s that I kind of reestablished um, a life of being outdoors a lot and it was also there that um, I went through kind of a life-changing experience that really sent me into the hills for a kind of solace. My, the man I was married to at that time uh, became very ill and um, eventually died. And I found that walking in the canyons was what I needed most to give me a sense of peace and to relieve my grief and anxiety at that time. And shortly after I moved back to New York City, but I realized very quickly that I needed to have some kind of place in the woods to go to as an escape valve. And that's how I first came to the Western Catskills in 2003 or four, and eventually bought a little place up here. And in 2009, I left the city to live up here full time. And that marked um, a big change in my life um, in which I found uh, a tie to the land to be very central to the daily rhythm. And it, yeah, it engendered a lot of changes in my life. Hmm. It's so interesting and poignant to um, hear you speak of this impetus for change being what I imagine is just unfathomable grief, encountering this grief. I've recently become enamored with the words and work of this gentleman, Stephen Jenkinson. I don't know if you're familiar, but he was in palliative care and he, he talks a lot about grief as sort of that we've lost grief literacy as a culture and the sort of ceremony of grief in the fact that it will not be negotiated with. We can't really go to grief with that same retail mindset, maybe that you're talking about. We just sort of don't know what's on the other side of that. It shows up and we just don't know what we're going to be afterwards. And I just wanted to draw out that little parallel there because I think it's interesting that bringing yourself to nature, which arguably has a lot less <sighs> explicit meaning that could show you and tell you what life is. It's not like uh, going to a Bible course or something and say, like, it's not going to hand it to you on a 
on a fortune cookie. It does. Oh, but it does. Okay. It can do it a million, a million different ways. Yeah. As soon as you see a Cooper's hawk eviscerate a blue jay in front of your eyes or come across um, a skeleton mm. in the forest, or even as some a woman once pointed out to me on a walk, looking at the beautiful curling silver bark of a birch decomposing on the forest floor, she said, that makes me feel better about aging. I mean, mm. the, the life lessons uh, that you see in nature are truly, um, they prepare you, they open your eyes, they cushion the blow of um, how we view death in our culture um, or they bring it into the light in a way that is um, reassuring and, and just plain and simple. You know, mm -hmm. um, the more time you spend in nature, the more you understand the cyclic nature of things. And the mm -hmm. rightness and the balance and the inevitability and the grace, it's all there. Mm -hmm. I know that another, you kind of hinted at it, but another part of the education and experience you provide is also then, you know, someone can walk away and really learn how to make an amazing ramp pesto or a black walnut bitters for some very sexy old fashioned they might want to have and prepare for themselves when they get home. So there's like a, a strong culinary component as well running through what you yeah, do. Yeah, that's a personal passion of mine. But I, I do think, you know, we there's a very strong lure by these delicious flavors, um, you know, that the plants offer us. And I'm really into the sensuality of it. Mm -hmm. really. Um, I, I want people to be drawn in by the beauty that is mm. there for us to appreciate. And that extends to flavor as well. Well, it's funny because there's some sort of like, I think maybe we imagine a certain austerity is needed. Um, maybe we all entertain this fantasy of just kind of dropping it all and living in a cabin and foregoing all the sort of comfort and <laughs> pleasures. But I, I sort of hear you, hear you say there's there's also a path that's, well, you use the word sensual, but quite yummy and something that we can follow. We can actually follow pleasure into this investigation. We can Absolutely. follow our senses. Yes. All, the senses all come alive and, and, are very important to satiate them in this quest to rediscover our true natures. Um, I think that it's not about austerity um, or separateness in, in a life that's connected to nature, but I do think there's a simplicity and there's an awareness that's required. I mean, you know, that, that's why I don't think that foraging is, um, is as a very simple act. It's a complex act that requires that you understand a lot more than just, can I eat this? It's also, who else eats this? When can I find this? What season it is, is it available to me in? With whom am I sharing this? Uh, how, what effect does it have? for me to take this plant or this nut or this berry from this area? Um, you know, is it an important food source for other, you know, fellow inhabitants more than human, human? Um, you know, it's, it's yet again, every time you stick a toe in a different sort of area of the natural world, you come up against this idea of interconnectedness. And, you know, coming to understand your own place in it, whether it's through uh, gathering things for your own nourishment, uh, inspiration for your artwork or writing, 
you know, what, what the things that we take away from it are things that we have to reinvest in a different way in order to perpetuate this sense of balance. I guess it's, um, it's kind of a question of a, a sense of place and, and belonging. I, I'm a West Coast transplant out here. As am I. As are you. I, I, my, my father's Mexican. He's from Chihuahua, from the mountains of Chihuahua. His family is Tarumat Indian. My mother is a Jewish girl from Chicago. I think we're similar in that way. Yes, I'm Mexican and Jewish. Yeah. So I think when you have like, you might call mestizo folks on a land that's colonized and industrialized, and you find yourself here living in a city environment and just say for one of our listeners that might find themselves like this, it's like, okay, my ancestry is not from here. There were people here before me have the complex and fraught history involved in that, in colonization, imperialism, whatever. And then simultaneously we have this alienation or this separation from myself and all this bounty that you're speaking of. How can, how can someone feel at home? In those in the, those contexts, how can they feel at home in a land they may not feel justified to be on or qualified to navigate? Well, those are some deep questions, and it brings up a lot of issues that we're all confronted with now in a way that we weren't even five or ten years ago. I suppose some of us. I mean, if you look at it that way, we are all introduced species. Who in these United States, so called? is truly native well none none of the white people and none of the black people only the indigenous you know so and yet many of us were born here and so we are native we may not be indigenous but we are native and um you know in the same way that i talk to you know the people that i walk with about uh, the vilification of so-called invasive species we are invasive species and so what i say about the plants many of which are classified as noxious invasive weeds um, is that if you are here you belong here and a lot of it is about intention and if you can do what you can to get educated about the history of this place and your own history. Um, you have every right to a connection to the land. And with that right comes the responsibility of understanding it, knowing what it needs, knowing how to be in relationship and in balance with it. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, I, I always acknowledge that um, this area of the Upper Delaware Valley where I live is, uh, is the land of the Lenape, the, the Muncie, the three clans of the um, eagle, wolf, and turtle, and uh, or rather turkey, wolf, and turtle clans. And you know, what does that, how does that really impact people that are hearing that? Um, is that serving to make them feel more alienated from this place um, and less responsible for it? Uh, how can we uh, share the teachings, most of which have root in indigenous knowledge about plants and culinary and medicinal properties of the plants here. How can we share that and have it not be intimidating and have it not be creating an otherness, but have it be simply a shared history worthy of, 
you know, respect and honoring. Um, so many people say to me, I live in the city. How can I connect to nature? And I just say, look up at the sky. Look down at the ground. There are birds and insects and plants everywhere. Raptors roost on skyscrapers in the city. Giant puffballs crop up in empty lots. I drive down the West Side Highway. I see burdock, Queen Anne's lace, wild roses. You know, it's all right there. You don't have to go anywhere. You are nature. Nature is all around. Do you think those insights, just even in the city, I know for me, even just a visit to Central Park, you could sit next, you know, underneath the ginkgo tree or something like that. These public spaces that we have, little snapshots of nature, sort of curated nature. I don't know but, if it's curated. I mean, yes, I think there's, you know, there's great value to be had in that giant hit of nature that you get when you go to the Grand Canyon or some mm -hmm. high peak or something like that. But that's not to devalue the small, small scale interactions mm. with nature. Those are equally important. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing about the pandemic, I think, is that people stopped traveling in that way of feeling like they needed to go to Peru or go to Costa Rica or whatever. And they just stopped and looked down at where they were. Mm -hmm. I think this going deep in, in, your, in your own surroundings and really getting grounded and rooted down where you live and belong and getting to know all the parts of it here is just if not more valuable than going somewhere far away for quote unquote a nature experience and if i could reflect some things back from that you know i hear you say that if we sort of just look down and look around and see where you found yourself that, that you're here i mean you, you you are where you've found yourself and that there's the possibility of feeling at home there, feeling accepted there. There's a certain privilege with that, that you acknowledge. Then I heard you say something really important that then with that is this responsibility. Something about that responsibility maybe closes that loop. Somehow if we can kind of participate in this, accepting ourselves, accepting the place in which we are, but then this responsibility to be a good steward of that place, we create kind of a circle of well-being or goodwill with, with our surroundings. Yes, yes. I don't like the word steward. I feel that it has some kind of patronizing quality to it. I, I think that we are mistaken in our assumption that we know best what belongs, how to tend um the land and so but i do like that word tend better than steward hmm. this idea that we are offering tenderness to the hmm. place that we are um and learning how to be in harmony with it um i don't i don't know that we have this omniscient way of being with the land anymore um, i think our ancestors knew how to be on the land and we've lost that and so we need to do a lot more listening and a lot less telling in order to reclaim some of that mm -hmm. so then <clears throat> What is the responsibility as you see it? How can we better be better, if not stewards, but be a little more tender, sensitive to our surroundings and the situation? I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think that the answer is common sense in some ways. Mm -hmm. We know mm -hmm. what we need to do. We know uh, what it means to be respectful and to honor. And, you know, it, it starts with... Um, with curiosity mm -hmm. and a desire to 
know, respect, and love the place that we live. Um, the Lenape were actually driven off these lands by the 1750s, and most of them ended up in Oklahoma and Canada. Uh, and I don't really know of any tribal representation in this area where I am. Anyway. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't become educated about the history of this place and mm -hmm. understand, you know, how to help heal the land um, ecologically. Um, there was a good an, a piece in Emergence Magazine last week or the week before. I believe the author was Canadian. Um, and she, it was a piece about invasive species, plant species. And she talked a lot about, um, you know, how we vilify plants and things that don't belong here. And eventually she decided that the best thing that she could do personally was to buy a piece of land and tend it and help it to uh, sort of reclaim the kind of ecological balance that it once had and that she felt it deserved. And that may be, you know, out of reach for a lot of people or feel like very extreme, but we can all do small versions of that. I mean, people still litter. You know, so Sam Thayer, who is one of my teachers, um, who is a, a very well-known forager, he lives in uh, Wisconsin. He says, adopt a little piece of land that you visit a lot and tend it. Pull out the non-native species that may be problematic um, for native plants you know, visit a particular area and help take care of it. And, you know, yeah, that might include taking some food for yourself, but you're also giving back through acts of tenderness and care. So that, does that answer your question? It does. So much of what you've said over the course of this conversation reminds me of being in a relationship, a romantic relationship. Uh, I mean, just. It is a romantic as an relationship. As an example, but just what it takes to, you know, you kind of show up that there can be a tendency to show up in, the, in a relationship and, you know, what can you do for me? And on the other side of that, there's, more of an openness, a willingness to meet that person for what they are and who they are and what they bring. And at the same time, then a little bit of work there and accepting yourself that you are lovable, <laughs> you're worthy of being loved and being in this relationship and receiving love and giving love. And then with that, some responsibility to that that relationship and then of course we can follow our curiosity and our pleasure and our sensual nature into those relationships but it, so much of what you're saying reminds me of this kind of give and take and what it's like to kind of get to know and be you know almost seduced by the call of nature have the your your, your curiosity seduced in a way Yes, she's quite the temptress. I like this analogy. You know, it's a very fraught time in terms of who deserves to be where and um, how we, how the language that we use to self-identify and identify others. Um, but, and I understand it's problematic, you know, that we are, colonizers of this land and yet this is our reality and we, we must work from this place and how better to do it than by uh, 
purposefully and intentionally um, honoring the land, whether or not it's quote unquote ours, we are here. And to be in an honorable and um, noble and loving relationship with the land, what more could we do? Thank you so much, Laura, uh, for your wisdom and candor in our discussion. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Make sure to check out the show notes and check us out on Twitter. Let us know what you think. Drop a comment. See you next time.